And, and now we have two incredible, incredible space architects, Dava Newman and Guillermo Trotti. My colleague Payal has this wonderful line in the handbook where she says, women might be from Venus, but if you want to put men on Mars, then you need Dava Newman. Uh, very often when we think of space travel, all our attention is on the spacecraft, you know, this wonderful burst of energy that crosses the stratosphere. But actually what we don't understand is that the space suit is as important as the spacecraft. And Dava Newman is instrumental in creating a new sexy leotard suit that will free astronauts to cover spaces that today they are inhibited from, from covering or crossing because of the clumsy spacesuits that they have to wear. The creation of this spacesuit is a highly, highly challenging job, and that is something Dawa will share with us. And with her is Guillermo Trotti, who is something called an extreme spaces architect. He has designed the South Pole Station. He has worked with NASA to design the Mars Station. He has built undersea spaces. He has worked on uh, Mars rovers, on every kind of fantasy object that we live with. Today, to share that whole exciting journey of the frontiers of human imagination, Dava Newman and Guillermo Trotti. Hello, Think. Let's begin. Thank you so much for the invitation to this wonderful conference to share our passion with you about exploration via space and sea. This is Spaceship Earth. It's the only one we have. So we need to take really good care of it. Our business is aerospace exploration, and everything we can learn, we try to bring back home to Earth for the benefit of humanity as an engineer, my partner, and architect. Yes, yeah, Spaceship Earth, uh, this is where we live. Uh, a phrase coined by Buckminster Fuller. Many of the young people in this audience might not know who he was, but Buckminster Fuller was a global thinker, and I was lucky enough to work uh, with him. Uh, he was an advisor to my thesis, changed my life, um, and started thinking about really the creativity and the way he perceived things. And uh, one of those great projects that he thought about was this idea of having uh, an Earth, a model of the Earth, right in front of the United Nations building over the Hudson River. <clears throat> so as uh, decision makers would be making decisions about the earth, about developing it, and about whatever, and their politics and the policies. Uh, they could see the earth and think globally, think about it in terms of not only their nations, but really the impact on it. Uh, it's a project that was very difficult to accomplish at the time, but we feel that this is a great time uh, to do something like that in the sense that we have the technology today. We know um, the weather patterns. We know uh, transportation in the oceans, we can really model these things and actually make projections of it and really try to understand what our design implications or uh, business implications might be in, on, on the Earth. Uh, just a bit of background, uh, I, uh, I was born in Argentina and arrived in the United States at an early age uh, for college at 19, uh, a, a couple of weeks before the lunar landing. Where uh, Armstrong and uh, Aldrin walked for the first time on the moon. Uh, it was very impacting on someone coming from uh, a country like Argentina, seeing this as a reality down the street. So um, I made it a point to pursue that idea as, an, as a career, as a how could I work with NASA uh, while I was here, uh, here in Houston. So um, it ended up that uh, and during my graduate year, uh, my thesis was a lunar base. Uh, then I did my work as a, on a master's on space stations, and that kind of launched me into a totally uh, different direction of what my career would have been. Uh, I started a program at the University of Houston where we had, uh, we have a program where uh, we graduate people with a master's in space architecture, doing research in all the different activities of space and ended up uh, diversifying to uh, extreme environments. And uh, working in space turned me into an industrial design, working in very minute details and, and high technology. 
and um, actually uh, became a, another major angle of my life. Uh, then that where we work with Deva on on uh, on space hardware. So. so I come from the state of Montana in the United States, a mountainous, beautiful state where I guess I grew up exploring nature. And I never dreamed of being an aerospace engineer. My family also comes from California, but um, inspired by Apollo that anyone could do anything if you had dreamt big enough and hard enough and seeing humanity reach out into the solar system. I was very, very inspired and why not? It might be for me. I've been very fortunate to be a professor at MIT for the last 20 years in aerospace. My specialty is looking at astronauts, astronaut performance. So it's a mix of aerospace and biomedical engineering. My love of the sea, again, probably comes when I meet Guy, and we decided to um, go around the world in, in our boat. Why? Well, it's an adventure, but maybe we need to explore Earth, explore this precious planet that we live on, and see how that's related to our professional jobs. So, we sailed, the two of us, uh, successfully around the world, and the real mission was to teach. Not teach at the university, that's what we do in our real jobs, but to excite kids and talk to island kids all over the world and say, this might be for you. You're gonna be the next young astronaut that maybe goes to Mars. You know, why not? During that time, uh, actually, NASA gave us uh, the great title of Solar Ambassadors. Uh, and what that entailed was that NASA gave us uh, the ability to communicate around the globe, whatever we were, uh, with uh, children and schools in the United States and uh, NASA astronauts. So during that time, we set up uh, many uh, three-way video conferences where the astronauts would tell their stories in space and we'd work on, uh, we talk about um, you know, our exploration experience uh, and how it was similar to being in space when you're in the middle of the ocean by yourself. So we taught uh, many, many students, over a thousand students uh, on the 35,000 miles around the Earth at a speed of basically jogging uh, because the sailboat moves by the wind very slowly. But it gave us the ability to meet so many people. The extraordinary thing about this trip was not an inner trip as, well, as much as an outer trip of learning about different cultures and how they live and you know, how they um, relate to their environment with their issues and so on. So it really, we have our, our lives divided in two, BC, before circumnavigation and ADC after <laughs> circumnavigation. It really was a life-changing experience. So today, uh, the, 10 years later, uh, we're taking some time off uh, to think. Uh, and that's one of the reasons we're here. We were able to come here. Uh, we're living on our boat again uh, for a few months uh, for this year and um, in Central America. Uh, that brings me to why in Central America is actually doing some work there, uh, building uh, as an architect uh, new developments in, in different islands in the Caribbean, uh, small resorts. Um, but the beautiful thing is that we're applying many of this philosophy uh, from working in space hardware and space development uh, uh, into a very local um, and very, uh, you know, hands-on uh, type of uh, architecture, uh, which is, uh, I call it my romantic years, <laughs> coming back to this, at uh, this time of my life where we're looking at and uh, working with masters that are, know about bamboo. And I'm as fascinated about putting a piece of bamboo together and thatch and rope together, handmade, as much as I'm excited about working with Deva on a spacesuit that is made out of carbon fiber and titanium and all these uh, communication technologies. But we do apply the technologies. Uh, many of the technologies are invisible, uh, like the communications technologies that we apply in the projects. But uh, we like to work with local labor. Uh, we engage as much as the industries in these areas uh, in the projects, uh, as carpenters, as uh, building doors and cabinets and so on. Um, and, and the materials and, that we use are uh, a lot of, as much as we can local. We import as, le the, as least as possible, or as little as possible. 
one of the exciting things uh, that I'm learning about actually is the landscaping. It's actually developing landscapes that are uh, beautiful landscapes with indigenous uh, plants, and uh, except for the plants that we bring for food. Uh, some are indigenous, you know, and so we have uh, fruit trees and herbs and uh, vegetables that we grow on site, you know, to f uh, feed the people and actually learn from the locals uh, how to uh, grow and how to raise these, these plants. So, <coughs> excuse me. Um, so anyway, working with local people, applying new technology, the same you know, the type of new technologies into the local environment. From there, uh, I'll take you to the other extreme of our work, and, uh, and it is uh, as far as the South Pole. Uh, I was lucky enough to win uh, a competition for the South Pole Station with the National Science Foundation for the United States, and uh, took me to the South Pole, worked in the ice, again, uh, learning from the environment, one of the reasons I think we won this competition was because of our experience uh, with space bases or lunar bases and, uh, and how to work logistics and modular buildings. Uh, one of the great developments of, the, uh, of working on, in the Antarctic was that every structure that you put on the ice is sort of like you put uh, something on the beach here. The wind blows and you, know, you have snow drift that bur starts burying the structures like snow would bury a, a Coke bottle that is in the sand. Um, and so we came up with this idea of developing aerodynamic structures because on the South Pole, you have the wind blowing 98% of the time from the same direction about the same speed. So your architecture becomes sort of like a standing vehicle. Uh, the atmosphere is flowing through it. So we accelerated the wind speed around the structure to clean the building, and in this way, we saved a tremendous amount of fuel, not only uh, on the caterpillars uh, cleaning the site, but on the airplanes taking uh, the cargo all the way to the Antarctic. So, in my early years, as I said, we worked on, spa on many space vehicles. This was in the 70s and 80s, before the space station was um, decided on. So, worked on vehicles for Mars, ve looking at or, or the moon, or uh, space, space stations uh, concepts. The idea of having a small group of people in a very remote and dangerous environment working and living at sort of a normal conditions where they can be productive. So did a tremendous amount of conceptual work for NASA and Vance Programs Office. And we are convinced that now we have a space station, we have an incredible laboratory, that is only 400 kilometers uh, above us. Uh, and it, the beauty of it is that it's international. We have a tremendous amount of scientists working from all over the world uh, in this uh, laboratory. What's next? The, the possibilities are many. We could go to the, back to the moon, we can go to Mars, and maybe visit the asteroids. So we're learning uh, about living permanently in space, you know, being self-sufficient in space. One of the concepts was the idea of going to the moon and using natu natural materials, such as basalts and the glasses there, for construction and maybe uh, some of the building blocks. And uh, many of the things like life support systems and so on would come from the Earth, maybe as uh, inflatable structures, uh, for instance. Yeah, the idea of creating very small, uh, large volumes for small structures, deploy them, and this is one of the things that I had worked with uh, back in Mr. Fuller in, the, in my early days. So presently, uh, we're working actually on a mobile architecture where we're developing these rovers uh, to travel around the moon. The, uh, the idea is that you want to explore. So if you build a base, uh, just normal architecture, you have a radius of, that, you, or, that you could explore. The idea of having mobile build, uh, buildings, basically, or modules. Uh, these are habitable modules, these rovers, uh, where it can carry three to six uh, crew members um, and their own life support system. Um, so in this way, we could explore all of the moon, all of the environment. You know, these vehicles have solar panels, uh, radiators, uh, so have truly self-sufficient. The only thing you have to bring with you is your food. So. 
crews would come in, explore for three to six months. When they leave, uh, new crews who can come in and they'll bring, bring their supplies with them, like food and some uh, oxygen. Uh, but their water, for instance, is totally recyc recyclable. But to do this, you really need to have a great spacesuit. We need to have an ex a flexible and agile spacesuit, and that is what David's going to talk about. So keeping people... So the next slide, we'll please. Move the slides. Keeping people alive in space is... Uh been the last decade-long project. First, I want to tell you about what happens when astronauts go into space. It's a great laboratory, but we lose our muscles and our bones. You see on the left, the skeletal system will lose 1 to 2 percent mineral density per month, six months on space station. Now, who wants to take my four-year Mars mission? So it's very <laughs> similar to bone loss on Earth and osteoporosis. We don't know, so we need a countermeasure. Maybe spinning, maybe you cycle your way to Mars. This is my students demonstrating artificial gravity. Very short arm artificial gravity, two meters. Guy has designed. Um, <laughs> we have Nishita to help us with some of the presentation. <laughs> Great model. So first I'll tell you a little bit more about conventional spacesuits before we get into the biosuit. We've been to the moon. 40 plus years ago, it wasn't, these I call my bloopers. The Apollo astronauts were not very mobile. Matter of fact, Jack Smith couldn't even find his instrument to do his geological survey. In the middle of the slide, you see the EMU. That's NASA's current spacesuit. It's a great design, it's great engineering. I call it the world's smallest spacecraft. Provides everything you need, all of your life support, your oxygen, scrubs your carbon dioxide but it doesn't have mobility. You definitely can't hang out on the edge of the stage. Mm -hmm. You can't bend. So we do a lot of research in the lab trying to say, what's the ideal suit? How would astronauts like to move? Natural mobility. Go ahead, please, the next slide. The current suit is 140 kilos and getting larger. 140 kilos. So we wanted to say, what's a different paradigm? Actually, thanks to Dr. Paul Webb, he thought of this in 1970. What if we give someone a skin suit? What if we shrink wrap the astronauts? Look at the mobility. Even in 1970, 1971, I think it was a great idea. He thought of a great idea. He couldn't implement it. NASA looked at this. It was a great mock-up, but he didn't have the materials. The materials development wasn't there. He needed some more engineering. This is the problem with the suit. Your two friends aren't going to go to Mars with you. You don't have anyone to dress you. Now, she couldn't almost dress herself in this suit. So we had to come up with a way that, how do you put it on, how do you take it off? Now, a spacesuit has to provide all of your pressure. So what you're looking at is the pressure layer, a third of an atmosphere, it's 30 kilopascals. If I can provide 30 kilopascals of pressure in the vacuum of the moon <laughs> or Mars lowest, so here's the problem. It looks like a leotard for a two-year-old, so NASA said no, and there was no further work. But in the background here, you see this big, infographic, human history of spacewalks. We've completed over 500 in human history, but the first Mars mission is about 1,000. So we call this a second skin suit. It's the bio suit. How could we improve on what was there? Well, we came up with a new pattern. And um, Iberal, back again in the 70s, thought about maybe a concept, but we basically did the mathematics. And the design of the suit, the Spider-Man looking aesthetics that you see, I have a little animation here. The math behind this, it's many PhDs and master's thesis. If you draw circles all over your skin, but you want maximum mobility, the circle will turn elliptical. But there'll be two bisecting diameters, those red lines. Those red lines will only pivot. They don't extend. So if I do the three-dimensional eigenvector analysis and connect all those red lines, I get the black lines here in the suit. So this is the pattern we get. Interestingly enough, you might see they kind of follow the major muscle groups, but she has full mobility, so it's kind of a soft exoskeleton. Then there's some gold lines. If you can take a look at the gold lines, those are basically smart sensors. You know, how hot am I? How cold am I? Can I heat up a little bit more? What's my blood pressure? How am I breathing? So they give you some physiological information. So it's really a complete digital design. We start from a 3D laser scan. We can get 20% of the atmosphere. We only need 30%. We can get 20% with passive elastic materials, the white that you see. 
some polymers, but pretty nice passive elastic spandex nylon. But I still need to get you to 30 kilopascals to keep you alive in space. So that's again where the black and the overlay come. So we laminate on the patterning. Our current research is working on advanced materials. Passive elastics and the design get you most of the way there, but if you see the red part of the suit, this is just again a, a mock-up for demonstration, but I can kind of tighten her up a little bit more. <laughs> this would basically be shape memory alloys or a dielastic um, polymer to cinch it up a little bit more. It's pretty comfortable, hopefully it's comfortable here. She's at one atmosphere, so I'm over-pressurizing her about 10% right now. But in the vacuum of space, there's no atmosphere. So 30% atmosphere is fantastic, and we gain the mobility. We're also working on, we're going to let Nashita get a little closer to you, because this auditorium is, is pretty large, and uh, you might not be able to see us. So I'm going to keep going. And she's uh, agreed to walk slowly through the people, so maybe you can take a, you know, put your hand up if you want to say closer look. We've developed a new helmet this year to go with a suit. She's just wearing the pressure layer. Of course, she needs a helmet, she needs gloves, and she needs boots. We couldn't bring those on the airplane with us. So the new helmet is here. It uh, uses your own neck musculature to move around so that you can explore where you want to explore. Mars is really extreme. You have to be an extreme athlete. Olympus Mons on Mars is fantastic. Mount Everest, puny. Valles Marineris, it's massive. The Grand Canyon in the US. So Mars is an interesting place. We're going there to search for the evidence of past life with rovers, humans and robots always working together. And we'll see how successful we'll be. Moving on, the one thing that uh, Guy and I have been so pleased about over the last decade, uh, the media and the press, I guess it's a nice looking suit. It's a very neuter gender. Everyone loves it and kids love it. Girls love it and boys love it. So we've been in museums to reach millions of children around the world to just spread the message that science and technology, engineering, math, it, it is for you. And we need every single one of these smart young people. We need them all. The world needs them all because we have major challenges in energy and water, et cetera. So we think that actually, again, at the global scale, we excite and get the passion and make sure that every little person has the opportunity to work in whatever area they want to work in. Uh, current suit, now back to the current big 140 kilo, the current NASA suit, it's injuring the astronauts. Again, it's a marvelous engineering design, but they have to train really hard in the water tank for the Hubble space mission repairs. Many, many astronauts have had shoulder surgery after so many hours, thousands of hours. So we get to design a new suit. This is a suit within a suit. It's basically a comfort protection level. We've just started this work this year, just again, trying to make the person comfortable. He's looking at new materials, new padding. We're really excited about this. We might be able to help the astronauts, but more importantly, hopefully we can help the elderly. The number one cause of death in the US for elderly folks from falls, hip fracture, then going to the hospital leading to death. So if we come up with a great padding system that might look very nice, and the aesthetics all go to Guy and his design team, then maybe we can help people on Earth as well. Then a final suit I want to tell you about. Think of it as the blue suit. The next one, it's a gravity loading suit. This is not to leave the aircraft, this is to stay inside, and it's also for Earth. If you stay inside, remember the muscle and the bone loss I told you about? 30% muscle loss, 40% muscle strength loss, and the skeletal is even worse. These 40, 50 year old healthy astronauts and cosmonauts, it looks like they have osteoporosis. They look like very unhealthy 85 year old folks with osteoporosis. We want to counter that. A new idea we have is to a loading suit. In space, we don't have gravity. Mars, we have three ace gravity. The moon, one six gravity. So we'll put them in an exercise suit. Apply pressure through the shoulders. It's a spandex suit. At your feet, you feel one body weight, one body weight of your loading. So every time you move, you're just exercising very slowly. But if you wear it for 12 hours a day, 24 hours a day, then you're exercising. This also has Earth applications that we're working on right now. So right now, this technology, our suit technology, both from the bio suit and the earth suit, is going to a pathology, two in particular. Uh, one for children with cerebral palsy, and the other one for the elderly uh, suffering from a stroke. 
The progress we've made is to put the sensing on board. These are very small sensors. They go right on the suit. They're just as big as my watch here. They're called inertial measurement units, borrowed from the aerospace industry, but now we're tracking human motion very cheaply, hundreds of dollars compared to very high-end motion capture systems that are $200,000 a system. Not very many people can afford them. Not many medical units have. So if we can put on cheap, available technology and track the motion, that's the sensing part. The sensing part in this suits we've made a lot of progress on. The hard part in the next coming years will be the actuation. A little person with cerebral palsy, can we help move their legs? We know how we want the legs to move to be normal motion, but can we just help in their daily life? So can we help actuate them? We think we can do it. You see the little fellow, this is a collaboration with our Russian colleagues, a little fellow uh, wearing a, kind of an exercise suit. He has cerebral palsy, so he's getting some rehabilitation and some exercises through this suit. So that's um, where we're going to end. The bell hasn't rung, but I think we're right on time. <laughs> and um, we wanted to go full circle. We're here today. We're, we're thrilled to be here. First time we've been um, to be able to bring the bio suit to India. Again, a mock-up of it, the engineering prototype stay in the lab. But this is a fifth version of the um, bio suit. So we'll bring an Ashita back up here. And we hope that all of our bring Guy over here. We hope that all of our research is, uh, we're passionate about human exploration of the future. We want to go beyond uh, this earth and everything we learn we'd like to bring back in some way for me as an engineer to think about mm -hmm. how can I help people here on earth, be it walking or performing. Maybe it could be for elite athletes, but I think it's more important to look at some of the pathology. It's pretty mobile. She's probably pretty hot. It's good that there's air conditioning in here because Mars is a very cold planet. We're definitely the space cadets, as you can tell. Uh, so uh, it's been a long time since we've gone back to the moon, about 40 years. Uh, we are very positive about the developments, uh, the new developments in space, given that we have this extraordinary laboratory that is international. We really excited about space, not only uh, because of the exploration, but truly is because of the way that brings people together. When you're in space, uh, when you talk to astronauts, when you talk to people that are in the business of space, they're all way, they think without borders. They think of the Earth. They really think spaceship Earth. And that is a key element of, uh, of our en en enchanted ways of living in this environment. Uh, so uh, we have a, a, a lot to do. We have a lot of young people in this country and a great <coughs> space program. Uh, that is getting started, and I think uh, in the way of uh, taking humans to space. Uh, so that's really the future, the way we see it, I think, really is one of the pieces of the puzzle that would integrate humanity uh, into looking at the Earth uh, without boundaries, without uh, different uh, countries, with societies, and really unite people. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. That one day on the red hills of Georgia, the sons of former slaves and the sons of former slave owners, we shall Hey.